Welcome to City of Hope. The Bible School has made a request for all Bibles, dictionaries, and Christian books to be donated to equip the under-resourced. If you would like to be kept updated with our services and events, please contact 079-520-2088. And so my title for this morning's message is Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man. Can you say that out loud? Say Jesus is the Son of God, but He's also the Son of Man. And so in Matthew 16, Jesus began asking His disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus asked, who is the son of man? And Peter answered, you are the son of God. And that's really the big deal here is that the son of God came as the son of man. And have you ever thought of this, that the reason why Jesus was crucified was not because he was the son of God was because he was the son of man. And he claimed to be the son of God. Jesus was so human that they said, you can't be God. He was so real on earth that they say, surely you can't be the Messiah. Now remember, every Jewish child was, was trained and programmed from, from, from childhood to wait for the Messiah, to wait for the son of God to come. And when he came, they failed to recognize him because he was too human. You see, being the son of God speaks of his divinity, but being the son of man speaks of his humanity. And his humanity was so real that they questioned his divinity. And back to fathers, back to Father's Day, every father has got a divine call on your life. But oftentimes the fact that we are human feel like it disqualifies us from that divine call on our life. Jesus was crucified not for his divinity but for his humanity. And oftentimes men and fathers in households, we feel like we get crucified not for our divinity but for our humanity. And sometimes we even disqualify ourselves from fulfilling the godly roles that he has called us to because we are so human. And wasn't that song so beautiful to say, I'm only human? I'm only human. But yet while you are human, man of God, in your home, while you are human, dad, in your house, God is saying there's a godly call on your life, and I've called you to represent my heart and my nature to your children and to your wife and to your household, and nobody else can do it like you do it. I remember one of my friends, he's a prophet, he says... Um, his, his, his one daughter, his youngest daughter, got croup. And when you get croup, the, the throat swells up. And I remember Lionel had croup. We had to rush her to hospital. But anyway, so he, his daughter gets croup, and she can't breathe anymore. So he's like, can I ask them all? And so what happens is he grabs her, but there's this thunderstorm going outside. Um, and, and, and it starts hailing and lightning bolts, and it's big hail balls. And as he runs onto the porch, the other two children come alongside. They're standing there. And he realized he can't run with her to the car because of all the hell. So he looks up. Whatever happened. He looks up and he says, In the name of Jesus, I rebuke this thunderstorm and I rebuke this hail to clear up immediately in Jesus' name. And in seconds, five seconds, it stops. And the clouds open up and you could see the moon and the stars. He says, She's children stand there. Their eyes are this big. He says, for instance, every, every word he speaks, if he says to a child, be, be quiet, they're quiet. They come eat dinner, they come eat dinner. Be ready for school, they eat. Ready for school. Everything he says, they listen to. For an entire two weeks, they listen to him. After that, no, he went back to normal. Okay. <laughs> but the reality that every father is, is facing is that oftentimes our humanity, we feel, is disqualifying us from the, from the godly roles that we have. But I want to encourage you. I got this revelation in preparing, and that is that the Son of God became a Son of Man, or the Son of Man, so that the sons of man 
can become sons of God. Can I repeat that? The Son of God, the divine became human so that the human can become divine, so that we can be called sons of God. And I want to preach at Father's this morning, encouraging you, don't ever let your humanity disqualify you from your divine role in your house. You may not always feel like you're the best dad, but you're a real dad. You are God's dad. You are God's father in that household. You may not do everything else like the neighbor who's got it all together, who seems like he's got it all together. But God is saying, I've placed you in that house for a purpose. He said, too many of us disqualify ourselves. Too many of us think, I'm not the perfect dad. And then, and then we abdicate and we, we give up. We, 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 we walk away from that responsibility. Your children don't need a perfect dad, but your children need a real dad. What gives me great encouragement is that there's three key areas in which we as men represent Jesus. Three roles, and it shares his names actually. The first one is as a priest, and in Hebrews, I believe it's 13 verse 5, it says, For we do not have a high priest. Can you say a high priest? We do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. The first area in which fathers represent Jesus is in being priest of the house. You are the priest, and we can add to that prophet in the house. You, you're the one that connect those children and that household to the presence of God, to, that connect that household to the plans and the purposes of God. And many of us fail in this area as fathers because we feel disqualified. Come on, how many of you as men, just be honest with me for a while, how many of you as men feel I can't be a spiritual leader in my house because I don't read my Bible enough or pray enough. Come on, this year, look. Like, just be honest. Even as a pastor, sometimes I feel like that. I feel I can't be, because I'm going to be a hypocrite if I'm not trying to teach my children about God because I have You see, that's exactly the accusation that the devil will want to throw at you as a man because the devil fears that you will rise as priest and prophet in your house even though you're human, even though you have shortcomings, even though you make mistakes. The devil is so afraid that you will realize the power of the father in the household. He's so afraid that you will begin to call out the, the destiny of your children, the identity in your children. He's so afraid that you will lead your children to, to apologize and forgive one another if they've had an argument. He's so afraid that you will get your children to pray together, to worship together, to praise together, to share communion together. Why? Because if men rise up in their homes, Satan has lost that household. If men rise up as the priest and the prophet in the house, the kingdom of God comes into that household. And Satan is scared and he will throw every attack because he is the accuser of the brethren. He will throw every onslaught and, and every accusation at you as a man to make you feel that you're not good enough. But I want to tell you today, God is saying, you are my man in that home. I'm not going to put another man in that home. If you're not going to do it, no one else is going to do it. And so what we do as men, oftentimes we give, we abdicate, we delegate our responsibility to be the spiritual priest in them, we delegate to our wives. Let them be the leader. They, they, they read the Bible more than us. They, they pray. Women generally pray more than men. Women read normally more than men. Because most of us men at the age of 40, we need glasses. Like, I need glasses. I, mean, I can not lees on my brill. My note is so great that I can lees. But I need to put on my glasses. So for me, it's difficult to read, you know, because I had me and my glasses and the Bible must all be in the same room at the same time. And that doesn't always happen. It's <laughs> moeite. We as men struggle to read. And, and then we disqualify ourselves and we, we abdicate our responsibility. And God is saying... You will let your wife read the Bible more than you. She can pray more, but you stand as the priest. You stand as the prophet. And I know there's many single families here. There's many families here represented where there's single moms. And, and my heart goes out for single moms. I respect single moms so much because you have to actually fulfill the role both of a father and of a mother. The single dads is here as well. Yeah, and, and you have to fulfill both those roles, and it's a lot of pressure there's blended families where, where, where some dads need to stand in 
for somebody else's biological children, but they have, they've also spiritually adopted them. And, 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 and that's sometimes difficult and it can be complicated. But God is saying, you are the priest in that house. You are the prophet in that house. And as long as you are there, Satan cannot enter if you fulfill that role. And the power here, Reg, is that he says, Jesus, identify 100% with our weaknesses. He was tested and tempted in every way. He's not a high priest that is, is, is removed from our reality, but he was human like us. Jesus says this morning to men, I know what it is to carry the weight of the world upon your shoulder. I know what it is to come and give your life for others and then be crucified by the very ones you give your life to. I know what it is. I know what you're going through as a man. When you feel you're all alone and there's nobody that helps you, there's nobody that, that appreciates you. You see, I want to just do a quick illustration. How many of you know there's Lion Matchbox? Remember, Lion Matchbox. And this is a picture, if you can remember this picture, is a picture of how family and what family is like. You see the, the little matches, uh, I've got five matches here, two, four, five matches in here. They represent the children, right? And the little blue box on the inside represents the mom, and she's the comforter in the house, and she's the one that kind of unfolds them, and uh, she, proceed, she, she uh, makes it comfortable, she feeds them, she nurses them. And then the dad is the, is the yellow lion box. It's like a lion. Come on, men, say, we are lions. Yeah, we came with the bus team. So he said, we are lions. It's like, I'm only human. So we're lions, okay? So, so what happens when the kids and the mum submits under the covering of the dad and life comes and shakes this family? What happens? Are we shaken? We are shaken, but we are not destroyed, right? Okay, what's going to happen if the dad vacates his position, abdicates his position, delegates his position? What happens if this household is now shaken? And our children fall out and they land. We don't know where they're going to land. What happens when a mom leaves a family for whatever reason, and the dad is here, but he's got his sides are open because he can't cover all the bases because he doesn't have all the attention to details. He doesn't have the emotional intelligence as the mum. And what happens then? Same thing. And it's not to gun a, a, a single parent family because God gives grace to that and God will maybe bring other men or, uh, or ngogos or, or um, um, madalas into the family or... I yeah, know, see, I know. God will bring other fathers to stand in, mothers to stand in. But God's heart is to put a mom and a dad in a, in a family. And you're not disqualified if you're not. God says, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to bring the, bring the church as a support structure around it. But his plan from the beginning was that there would be one that nurses and holds the family together and another one that covers. And the lion covers. See, something terribly goes wrong and is disturbed in a family when a man does not fulfill his role. Second one is, I'm a provider. Can you say, I'm a provider? Okay. See, Abram, when he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, in obedience to God, because God was testing his heart, and as he took the knife out to, to slaughter Isaac, God spoke to him and said, no, no, I've made provision and it says here, and Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. I feel there's some man that, that, that you're praying and you're trusting God for provision, and, and, you, and you're about to make some decisions, and God is saying, lift up your eyes, because there's provision made available for you. And there's this ram caught in the thicket by its horns, and Abram went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abram called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Fathers play a role in the family as providers, but I need to qualify that. Because you as a dad are not the provider of your household. God is the provider of your household. 
And sometimes as dads, we put too much stress and strain on ourselves because we take all that weight and, and it weighs us down because we think we need to provide every single cent that comes in. But no, no, no. You are the representation of the provider in your household. You are only representing the provider in your household. What does it mean? It means, Francois, that you and I are called to steward the provision of God in our household. It means that we need to make sure that the conduit, the channel that is linked up to heaven's source of provision is connected to our household. Because many things can disconnect this pipeline. If there's unforgiveness and strife in a family, the provision of God can stop. If there's hidden sins, the provision of God can stop. You see, it's the heart. Open hearts opens the heavens. And so as a father, it's your responsibility to take this conduit of your family and keep it connected to God, keep it connected to, to the source of provision, to Jehovah Jireh, the provider, so that it can flow into your family and then steward it well. I remember, I remember, and I want to honor my dad, because you're growing up, we were very poor. We grew up in a time where the church believed, you know, God will keep the pastor humble, but we as a church must keep him poor. Really, they believe that. We were so poor, Ivan, that we couldn't even pay attention at school. <laughs> no, we weren't that poor, but we were poor middle class. But you know what? Growing up, we could never afford like what other kids could afford and do stuff. But I want to honor my dad because you know what he did is he taught us to trust in Jehovah Jireh. He trained us to trust God. He connected our hearts to the heart of the provider. Amen. I remember we liked fishing. My brother still loves fishing. I can't even find my hand in my fist. You know, I don't like fishing. But anyway, he loves fishing. So we wanted to buy a canoe so you can take your lines in. And we didn't have the money. So my dad knelt with us. I remember still him kneeling with us at the bed saying, we're going to pray that God will provide. And within a couple of weeks, without us ever mentioning it to somebody, somebody had given us a canoe, fishing canoe. And I can tell you story after story after story after story of how my dad trust, taught us how to trust God for provision. We, we prayed for an air rifle. We wanted an air rifle. And it was so expensive those days. He didn't have the money. We prayed, and within a, a month... Somebody came and gave us one of those lawny ones, not the one that the neck breaks and you put the one that it's got this you venomy after up and then you put the bullet in. It looked like a proper gun man. And you could shoot from far, you can shoot a Volky. Sorry for those who don't like killing, but you know. But God had provided in our needs as boys. And God, my dad had taught us. He had connected our hearts to the provider. Your role as a dad is not to provide every single cent your family needs. Because in many households, the wives might even earn more than the husband. But it's still your role to represent the provider in your household. Make sure the blockage is not there. If there's, if, 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 if there's not tithing going on in the family, that's the husband's responsibility to say we want to connect to the provider so that it flows. And so it's our responsibility to teach our children as fathers. But seek first the kingdom, Matthew 6.33, and his righteousness. And some of these things, or all, all of these things will be Add it onto him. It's our responsibility to teach them to put God first, to put his kingdom first, and God will take care of your needs. And then the last area in which fathers represents Jesus is as a protector. And I want all the dads to say, to say this, I am the priest in my house. Come and say it again. I'm the priest in the house. Say, I'm the protector in the house. I'm the provider in the house. And so as dads, our role is to protect our children. That's why we put, how many of you have got burglar bar on your, on your home, your, on your windows, or palisade fencing, or electric fencing, or cameras, or alarm system? Why do we, well, how many of you dads at night before you go to bed, you lock up the doors, make sure all the doors are locked? Come on, even you're letting them. Why? You're the protector. 
You don't want a robber to come in and steal because if we leave a door open, they can find easy access. If you leave the gate, the car gate open during the night, somebody can just walk in there and come and rob the family. So we are, we're protecting our family. God is protecting us. Jesus is our protector. Abram writes and he, and he says about God, he says, God is my, my shield and my exceedingly great reward. God is protecting me, but in the same way, as a father, you protect your children. Not only physically, but we also have a call to protect our, our family spiritually and emotionally. You see, as a, as, as, a, as a father, I cannot allow ungodly things to enter our house. Because what I've, whatever I allow to enter my house will prosper in my house or will fester in my house. If I allow a thief, a boof, to come in, what's going to happen? He's going to prosper in my house. He's going to walk away with my stuff. He's going to steal my children's stuff. Right? So I have to lock the doors and lock, keep the, I'm the gatekeeper of that house. But spiritually and emotionally, we leave doors open and we allow the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, we allow him into our households. We allow an attitude of rebellion to come into our household and he's robbing us of our peace and he's robbing us of the plan. We, we allow an attitude of dishonor towards parents to come into our house. And you know, the Bible says, every child who dishonors his parents will be cursed. So I'm thinking... Let me go soft on this child and, and allow him or her to get away with their tantrums, with their dishonor, with their disrespect. But I'm bringing a curse on that child. I'm opening the door as a father, as a mother. I'm opening the door. I'm opening the gate and saying, you curse, come in and go and curse my child because he's disrespectful and rebellious and dishonoring. So there's certain things that we do not allow in our house. There's certain things that the door is shut. A tantrum is not allowed in my house. Not by a child and not by a parent. And some of you say, Amen. And some of you say, Amen. amen. Disrespect is not allowed in my house. That is a demon that I don't want in my house. Rebellion, manipulation is a demon that will not come into my house. I will not entertain it in my house. I'm putting my foot down. I am the priest. I am the prophet. I am the provider. And I am the protector in that house. And it's time that we as Christian fathers, as Christian parents, put our foot down and say enough is enough is enough. Another way in which we open doors is through these devices. You see, the family has found a way in. There's a spy in your house. There's a secret operative in your house. Not just in your house, in the pocket of every one of your children and in their faces and social media. Not everything on social media is bad, but you need to be in control of what your children are watching. We need to be in control of what they are watching because it's, they've just been fed. They've just been brainwashed. They, you must check what they TikTok because TikTok, TikTok time is ticking away for you to build into your child godly values. It's so convenient for us, and I'm guilty. It's so convenient to give them their phones and it keeps them out of our hair because sometimes we can't stand them. I'm just being an honest parent here, and I've got good kids. <laughs> but guys, we need to own up as parents and say, no, limit their time. Be sure what they're watching. Don't let them be in their, alone, in their rooms alone for an extended period of time. Oh, and I don't want to teach you how to be a parent, but I want to encourage you to be the priest, prophet, and king and protector of your children. 